Today we come to the last of the requests or statements in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into the test. God does test us, but he never tempts us. And it may be his will to expose us to testing, to develop us, or to grow us in various ways. Think back to the story of Joseph, how after coming through all that he came through, that is his, well, being lifted up in the eyes of his brothers, being cast down into the pit, to being sold down to Egypt, to being lifted up again in the eyes of his master Potiphar, to being cast down again and put in prison because of an unjust accusation, to being lifted up in the prison and then to be cast down again when he was forgotten by those who were able to get out of the prison, one to success and the other to beheading, and then finally to be lifted up before all as he was then appointed as the prime minister of Egypt. And at the end of all of that, as he stands before his brothers, he says, not someone to him, he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In other words, that there was a meant in there, there was a purposefulness in this, that God was doing something. Now, he talks about it as the good of rescue for his people. But I also think that there was a good in it for Joseph too. All that time of testing, all those years in prison, all of those struggles and trials and overwhelming concerns of his heart at dark days and, and better days and so forth. And so God does test us. I mean, take, for example, the words of Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, when he talks about his people in the wilderness, Moses is reminding them, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. This testing was not just for God to see. I think God knew right from the very beginning. So I don't really think it's that sense that I, I need to put you through this test to see. God knows, I think. But they need to know. You and I need to know what is in our hearts. But here we are asking that if the Lord should test us, that it would not be in a place or in a way that we, to quote another, are liable to fall. Each of us would find certain places and situations very threatening to our stability and to our very nature, our characters. And the fact that Jesus encourages this is speaks to us in such a way to give us permission to talk about it with the Lord and these personal struggles we have. There may even be a sense in praying this way as a way of speaking to our hearts so that having just prayed it, then will it not heighten some sense of attention to the potential dangers that our hearts and lives are in? It's a bit like a reminder of our own weakness and our frailty. If I'm saying, Lord, lead me not into the test, I'm conscious that, that I don't know if I can cope with tests. I'm a weak man. I fail so many times. And then the second part of this request is, then deliver us from evil or the evil one. Now, we know that there is evil in the world in so many forms. It's sometimes like that old witch in the Little Red Riding Hood story, all dressed up to deceive us. But then, of course, there's also the evil within us. I remember hearing Michael Ramsden, who works with the, Ra the Zacharias Trust, telling of a time he went to get his hair cut. And the lady who was cutting his hair was in a bit of a rush, but she sat him down and they were having a conversation. And do you know the way it is? In the hairdressers, they are brilliant at conversation. And so she asked him what he was doing and so forth. And the, the conversation developed a little bit. And then she was very evidently expecting a baby. And uh, the conversation got round to that. And she said, well, I'm just really concerned, you know, about bringing a child into this world and all of the evil in this world. Michael then said, well, what about the evil within us? Which, of course, was a totally new thought to her. At that point, she stopped and she looked at him and she said, that's most interesting. She ran away and got a, a pen and a piece of paper and wrote that phrase down. It began a series of, com of, of, of dial a bit of dialogue between the two of them where he asked questions, she asked questions, and she wrote all of this down. And uh, it was a, a great opportunity to share the faith with her and get her to think. But isn't it true? What about the evil inside of us? 
Would we recognise this evil if it was dressed up for a Sunday? Is that not the very core of evil? It's so evil that it uses its evil skill to deceive and delude and to fool us. And I'm sure we've been led astray by it on various occasions. The Bible describes it a little bit like a flashing lure to a fish. That's the analogy in James. It flashes and it makes you think it's something else that you want, but it's really very dangerous. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his book on the Sermon on the Mount, asks this question. He says, why should we pray like this at all? Not simply to become a good holy person that we avoid evil things. No, he said, that, that is okay, yes, but beyond that, surely it's to really enable us to have a very close personal relationship with our Lord. We don't want anything to interfere with the communion and sense of fellowship that we might enjoy. That's at the whole heart of this. We began this prayer with our Father. It's personal and intimate. And we know the thing that destroys that, our relationship, is sin and evil. So in so praying with this motive, as it all relates to our Father and to our deep relationship with him and to our Saviour, Jesus knows just how precious this is. It's also successful, surely. Why else would Jesus guide us to pray this way? He wouldn't get us to pray to deliver from evil if in the praying it we were not to be delivered from evil. Of course we are. I think we need sometimes just to kind of stop and think about this. Even praying in the name of Christ is such a powerful thing. We often forget that. We think it's just a little throwaway phrase. Well, we ask ourselves about this, this prayer of the Lord that we call the Lord's Prayer. Do we pray it just verbatim? wrote? Well, I think we can, and I see no problem in praying it, because if we pray it slowly and thoughtfully and deliberately, understanding, as we've been trying to do over this last few days, understanding what each phrase means, then I think it's like being a port we arrive at from which we make sort of, we, we advance out in many directions and explore the new land. We arrive at this place, this port called the Lord's Prayer, and then we move out guided by the Holy Spirit in all directions. But to do it wisely is to slow down and to think of the various issues that it means. So, praying like this, lead us not into the test or temptation. It might do this. It might lead us to think about our sense of weakness and how to grow stronger in character in more detail. And we might begin to pray about that. Or it might lead us to think over recent failures or successes to either thank God for the success or to pray about the failures. Or it might help us to pray for others where there, we sense danger in their lives. Lord, for our friends, that you would also lead them in a way that they might be delivered from this testing and trial. Or maybe just to discuss the days ahead, a sort of diary detail, a potential roadmap, roadmap to plan prayerfully for wisdom, like walking the road circuit I think of, uh, I was talking to a friend the other night just about Joy Dunlop and they were chatting about his skill and I said, you know, he sometimes walked around the circuit to find every bump and, and curve and hollow and camber. This could, praying could be a little bit like that, going into the future and praying ahead of time. And then, finally, the, whether or not the original had this doxology, for thine is the power and the glory and so forth, it's, it's not in this Luke account you'll find, you'll see there, the one that I was quoting from in Luke 11. But it is very good to have a sense of doxology about our lives. Praise and thanks and glory to God. Because, as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the measure of our spirituality is the amount of praise and thanksgiving in our prayers. Praise, therefore, is a stability as well as a means of propulsion in terms of, say, if you take nautical terms, it's like the ballast in the bottom of the ship to keep it from tossing about, but it's also a means of keeping us moving forward wherever we are. So today, you can pray this prayer with a great sense of confidence and hope because you are the Lord's child if you are trusting in his Son. And praying this prayer will anchor you in so many ways and focus you again. Now tomorrow, God willing, we're going to move back to Proverbs and we're going to be thinking about the use of our tongue. So the Lord bless you 
today.